This is a Russian PT-76, the current Red Army amphibious tank. It is now the property of the United States. It was not given to us by the Russians, nor did we purchase it, nor did we capture it in battle. You could say that it was obtained, all 15 tons of it, through intelligence channels. Or you could say we stole it. Once upon a time, spying or espionage was a fairly straightforward game. But we have come a long way, rather quickly, from Mata Hari. There is something new in the science of spying. It's not just stealing military hardware and secret plans, but using tanks and plans and men to promote our policies around the world and sometimes to overthrow governments we don't like. Both sides in the Cold War do it, both sides deny it. In the spy business, the dagger is replacing the cloak. And that is what this program is about. Self-protection is a primary function of any organism. That is as true of the green grass as it is of continental nuclear powers. Since the beginning of man, tribes and clans and nations have spied on one another across the valleys, across the oceans, and now across the world. We watch for the electronic imprint of the enemy's bombers. We listen for the whine of his missiles. We send beautiful, sophisticated machines over his territory to monitor his coded talk, to tally his gantries, to make inventory of his weapons. The very air is full of information for the spies of today. Much of this for Americans begins and ends in this building located at Langley, Virginia. This is the headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States government. Everybody knows it, although the sign on the gate reads Bureau of Public Roads. It might have been designed by Ian Fleming. Serried, secret cubicles, computers which translate Russian to English at 30,000 words an hour, documents burned in a $100,000 furnace. This is the Pentagon of the secret war. It is a depot for subversion and a kind of clandestine university. For many years, its scholarly headmaster was a super spy in the classic mold named Alan Dulles. Intelligence is nothing really other than information and knowledge. Uh, from the days of Socrates, by various methods, and even before that, uh, mankind has been seeking knowledge of everything that influences his own life or the life of the nation to which he belongs. Uh, but the idea that uh, it is necessarily nefarious, it's always engaged in overthrowing governments, that's false. That's for the birds. Now, there are times, there are times uh, when the United States government feels that the developments in another government, such as in the uh, Vietnam situation, is of a nature uh, to imperil the the safety and the security and the peace of the world and ask the Central Intelligence Agency to be its agent in that particular situation. Mr. Dulles, I know you've heard this many times, that there are people who say that we, with regard to the CIA, are waging a secret war with an invisible government. Uh, we are obviously engaged in many facets of what is generally called the Cold War, uh, which uh, the communist policy is forced upon us. No use denying that, that's, that's a fact of life. But may I say this, and I do it with all solemnity, at no time has the CIA engaged in any political activity or any intelligence activity that was not approved at the highest level. Whatever you say about it, the CIA has kept busy for the past 18 years. This is Laos in Southeast Asia, not so much a kingdom as a political playing field for the great powers. Some Laotian warriors are supplied by the Russians, some by the Americans. The United States supplies 100,000 tribesmen with rice and bullets through a sort of air CIA. Secret contracts with so-called private airlines. One is called Air America. 
In all, a fleet of 50 aircraft is involved, all flown by civilians who are often the target of communist gunfire. No. <laughs> <laughs> we found two of the pilots in a Hong Kong bar, a New Zealander named Len Cowper and an American named Chuck Bade, reminiscing about their secret flights. So as we were flying along, I heard, uh, you know, pop, pop, pop. Up, 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 and biting into the aircraft. Yeah. And so I looked out the side there, and these, and the PLs were lined up there, about 15 or 20 on each side, at practically point blank range. One of the boys quit the day after. He was a little bit green. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the men that you knew down there, uh, mm. and how many guys were killed? Well, it was Serena and Campbell, uh, Chet Brown. Woody Baker, I'm oh, sorry, Woody Ford, um, Joe Riley. Good evening. Good evening. How are you tonight? Wonderful, thank you. Having a nice day? Just fine. Everything all right? Even better since you came. Thank you. What kind of missions actually were you flying down there? Um, With your... Well, sometimes we didn't really know, you know, I mean, we would arrive, I'd arrive down at the um, office in the morning, and let's say you've got a flight on to, um, to Phong Sali, right up north, right on the Chinese border, right in the very northern end of Laos. Quite often I didn't even know what I was going to do. I just knew that I had a load to take up there and people to take up there. I didn't know what they were for. I wasn't paid to know. All I was paid to do was take them up there. Really, uh, I really never knew who, who I was picking up. <laughs> I never knew who was launching me, <laughs> except... Uh, like a blind date. Right. One blind date in 1953 involved the overthrow of the premier of Iran. The CIA was clearly involved. The government of Mossadegh, if you recall history, was overthrown by the action of the Shah. Now that we encourage the Shah to take that action, I will not deny. Actually, the Shah had tried to fire Premier Mohammad Mossadegh and had failed. With the help of CIA and British operatives, though, he was finally ousted. Mossadegh's crimes had been his nationalization of the great pool of Persian oil and his flirtation with the Russians. When it was all over, the West had held onto the oil and Mossadegh had only his famous tears. The CIA is alleged to have sent this P-51 fighter against Indonesian President Sukarno in 1958. Sukarno then captured an American pilot named Alan Pope. Pope had been flying a B-26 bomber for anti-Sukarno rebels while working for the CIA. Well, all I can tell you is that we were not uh, very happy with Mr. Sukarno in what was that year, 19... 1958. 1958, and I don't think we were very happy with him in 1965. The Congo is a natural and deadly battleground for American and Russian agents. The latest CIA help to the central government is an air force piloted by Cubans. Is it possible that there may have been American agents in the Congo who turned up later in Laos? I mean, are, are, are these men on both sides engaged in these battles around the world? Oh, yes. Do they meet? Uh, Do they? Well, if they meet too much and are seen too much, uh, then they use their utility. Even in Tibet, where rebels fight the Chinese communists, there is the CIA. If it would help, the CIA would recruit the abominable snowman. Well, I'm not going to go into the Tibet situation separately because uh, uh, we might have got started wandering all around the world, and I would uh, uh, be uh, going beyond of what I, even what I know about. Uh, I do think that there are times uh, where uh, the supporting of, uh, of movements that are favorable to you in a murky situation is one of the best ways of uh, preventing that uh, movement from becoming the communist movement from taking over. Uh, and that has been done from time to time. Do the Russians have a CIA? The KGB is one of the most sinister organizations that ever was organized. Are they any good? Are the Russians good at this? Oh, yes. Oh, my, yes. You take some of their operations, they're classic. 
And then when we lost Czechoslovakia, uh, that was a classic operation. Uh, you take their operation in Cuba. Uh, great skill was shown in that. You take several things they're working on now, such as Indonesia, the Sudan, and, and so forth and so on, because they have a marvelous apparatus. Do they spend more money than we do in these activities? Oh, they must. Do we have a, an application of morality in our activities? They don't? Oh, far more than they do, yes. Could you talk on that subject? Well, only that, uh, as far as I know, we don't engage in assassinations and kidnappings and things of that kind. As far as I know, we never have. As far as we know, they have and done it quite consistently. Did you apply, for example, moral standards to what you did when you were director of the CIA? Yes, I did. Why? Uh, because I don't think, uh, given the caliber of the men and women I had working for me, I didn't want to ask them to do a thing that I wouldn't do. One or two said that even what I assigned them, they preferred not to do. That was all right with me. I didn't ask them to do it. All I can say is that uh, uh, I... Uh, I'm a parson's son, and I was brought up as a Presbyterian, uh, maybe as a Calvinist. Maybe that made me a fatalist. I don't know. Uh, but um, uh, I hope I have a reasonable moral standard. The man who created the U-2 also planned the Bay of Pigs. One was a fantastic success, but the other wasn't. Richard Bissell is now a private citizen and a thoughtful one. Mr. Bissell, it's a truism in our society that moral ends don't justify immoral means. And yet you and your colleagues in the CIA must on many occasions have had to abandon that principle. How do you deal with it? I suppose that the way people deal with this under all kinds of circumstances, and the one that occurs to me as the most prominent historically is, is warfare, is that they feel uh, a higher loyalty and that they are acting in obedience uh, to, to that higher loyalty. In my position in the CIA, I had a chance to know of and remotely to observe many operations. And, and I will not deny that th there were occasions when the Americans involved in these, as it were, out on the front, had, as people do in wartime, uh, to undertake actions that were contrary to their moral precepts. But I will say that um, I think this happens a great deal less often, again, than one might surmise. I think the morality of, shall we call it for short, the Cold War is so infinitely easier than the morality of almost any kind of a hot war. that uh, I never encountered this as a serious problem. The distinction between cold and hot war morality became academic to the crew of this British coaster on the 28th of June, 1954. Called the Springfjord, she was lying off the coast of Guatemala that day, loaded with coffee and cotton. That happened to be the time when the American government was overthrowing the communist-oriented government of Guatemala. A P-38 fighter operated by the CIA flew overhead. Its American pilot thought the Springfjord was carrying aircraft to the legal government of Guatemala, so he dropped three bombs. Only one went off while the crew escaped unhurt, and all 2,000 tons of the Springfjord now rest on the beach, testimony to a rather startling miscalculation. This pained the CIA, but the whole Guatemalan episode pained other Americans, some of them influential. One of them who was pained and is pained is Senator Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota. Now, if, uh, if we believe that the Constitution says about the responsibility of Congress to declare war, for example, to have the CIA at the direction of a president 
actually fomenting or carrying on a war in a country, if it were to do this, without any kind of congressional approval, I think would put some real strain uh, on the Constitution. Uh, it, it's interesting to note that uh, people from small countries, or Latin American countries, for example, uh, are always greatly concerned about our CIA because a, a secret agency of this kind in a relatively small country with a weak government can become the, the real force of government. And it did happen here. Guatemala City, the capital of a country where the rich are very rich, the poor very poor, and the politics all mixed up. Guatemala is the kind of Central American country that used to be called a banana republic before people started talking about wars of national liberation. Most of the citizens of Guatemala are Indians, and most of them live in the shadow of a small, wealthy class which owns most of the arable land. It is still a plantation society, plagued by the economic and political illnesses of such a society. For most of its history, it has been ruled by a dictatorship. But as the 1950s began, the pendulum swung from right to left, and the winds of change swept across Guatemala. The pendulum swung very far left with the election in 1950 of Colonel Jacobo Arbenz as president. He confiscated the lands of the wealthy and filled his government with communists. He became, in local and American eyes, a menace. So the American government, through the CIA, made an alliance with Arbenz's opposition, and as of that moment, he was doomed. An American who had been air attaché at our embassy there, named Fred Sherwood, tells how the plot began. Uh, several of us thought that perhaps we could stop this movement by organizing something in the form of vigilantes or night riders. For example, uh, there was a group that tried to uh, bring in some Puerto Rican and Cuban gangsters who made an offer, a package deal to speak, to, uh, to kill or assassinate any 12 communists within the country for $50,000. We, uh, many, we went around trying to raise money, but uh, we were only successful in raising a part of this, and so this did never came off. But this demonstrates the desperate situation that was, the country was in at that time. The American government threw in their forces with these small groups and helped organize these resistance groups to combat the communist force existing in Guatemala. This help was forthcoming in all sorts of technicians, pilots, demolition teams, radio technicians, professional psychologists who organize rumor networks. These men provided the, the know-how of organizing a successful revolution. We had, fortunately, two wonderful ambassadors in Guatemala and Honduras. Jack Purifoy had been selected very carefully as ambassador to Guatemala as he had just cleaned out the communists in Greece. Whitey Whitauer was named ambassador to Honduras. Whitey Whitauer was General Chenault's deputy of the Flying Tigers and also form the Chinese National Airline. I am quite certain that if any of the planes flying for the Liberation Army had been shot down, some of those pilots could have spoken Chinese. The most important pilot for the Liberation Army, however, spoke American. The Liberation Army was CIA-sponsored and directed, but it didn't have an easy time in its overthrow of the Arbenz regime. had bogged down when an American freebooter named Jerry DeLarme strafed the city and blew up the government oil reserves. DeLarme did that while flying a P-47 furnished by the United States. Now he flies his own Lodestar, owns his own charter service, and minds his own business. I've been flying uh, in Latin America for ever since 1939, off and on. 
I like it here. It's uh, easy living, fiestas, and uh, not too much rushing, no rut. Nice place. The first problem I had with uh, communism down here started back in the time of Colonel Castillo Armas in Guatemala. That's when I started, I was contacted, and uh, from then on, that's about it. Two days after Delarm blew up the oil reserves, Arbenz resigned. However, his replacements hesitated to embrace Delarm's employers, so Delarm got back in his plane and blew up the main army powder magazine, which rather decided the question. The replacement for Colonel Arbenz was Carlos Castillo Armas, the entry backed by the USA. He arrived in the American ambassador's plane. Within about a month, there was little trace of the Marxist innovations of Colonel Arbenz. Mr. Bessel, Guatemala and what the United States and the CIA did there came within your tenure at the CIA. Do you regard Guatemala as a success? I do. Can you tell me a little more about it? Why you regard it as a success? Well, I'll give you first an answer that may be slightly bureaucratic in, it, in its tone, but that, uh, in the case of that operation, notably, as of other large operations, the whole policy-making machinery of the executive branch of the government was involved. By reason of its nature, the CIA had an assigned role, which was really in a major role in that operation. And I say it's a success because the assigned role was carried out um, substantially as assigned. There was one sub-incident in that, which I don't wish to identify, in which an action was taken that went beyond the established limits of, of policy. And I mention it only because you can't take on operations of this, covert operations, or, or, or forward for that matter, of this scope, draw narrow boundaries of policy around them, and be absolutely sure that those boundaries will never be overstepped. The overstepping, in the case of the Guatemala operation, the one case I'm aware of, mercifully turned out to be of, of little significance and to do no political and minor financial damage to the United States or, for that matter, to anybody else. So I say that it was, from the standpoint of an organization commissioned to do a job, just an unqualified success. But I think the, the basic question with regard to Guatemala is whether or not the CIA carried this out on its own initiative, in which case it, it would be wholly improper. Secondly, the question to whether they carried it out with some kind of presidential direction, uh, which if they did would be subject to some question, because uh, an action to overthrow an established government is essentially an act of war. And it's my judgment that there ought to be some kind of involvement and some kind of commitment on the part of the Congress to fully satisfy uh, uh, the, uh, the Constitution. There is more to this story. The sanitized Guatemalan regime of Castillo Armas lasted for two years, and then he met his death in the presidential palace. The killer was a palace sentry who took his own life. Therefore, no one knows for sure who murdered Castillo Armas. Some of his associates had found him to be too honest and too liberal. His was a regime not without corruption and with considerable American aid. Guatemala's next president was Miguel Idigaras Fuentes, progressive and pro-American. He was plagued by communist guerrillas, but his downfall came from the right at the hands of his own defense minister. Fuentes is now an exile in Costa Rica. He tells how he allowed the CIA to use his country as a training camp for the brigade of Cuban refugees who landed in the Bay of Pigs to overthrow his old enemy, Castro. It was very difficult to get the connection until the beginning of 1960. And um, 
Then we talked with uh, uh, President Eisenhower, and then he sent some people to my country. Of course, they were not military men, they were civilians. They presented, presented me some credentials. Uh, the credentials were from the CIA. I have never uh, seen uh, them before. And they um, asked me not to, uh, to ask for, for principal names, only for first names, as Peter, John, James. The most difficult of the problem was to look for a place where no spies and, and, uh, and press, press men went to, to see how they were uh, doing. And Mr. Alejos offered his uh, coffee plantation, a farm called the Elvesia. We, we denied, as usual, all these uh, organizations saying that it was uh, only rumors and that it, it, it doesn't exist any, any camp. And they, they um, built some roads you know, to reach uh, these, these hidden places, and they uh, built some small barracks in wood. But we gathered there near 2,000 uh, young men, very, um, very enthusiastic, with very good uh, trainers, this hilly place has just about been taken over by the forest. This was the campground of the proud and optimistic Cuban brigade, recruited, paid, trained, supplied by the CIA and perhaps the largest covert operation in the history of subversion. What remains now is only the outdoor altar at which the Cubans prayed for victory. The CIA's Richard Bissell, author of The Invasion Plans, reflects on the lessons learned. I think this is an unlearnable lesson. In any future operation of this kind, again, there is going to be an operator. His eyes are going to be fixed on the success of the operation. So far as he is concerned, it is going to be desirable to do things that from the standpoint of others in the government will involve major risks in a quite different dimension. There is always going to be this incredibly difficult choice, and if it's an important issue, it's going to be, in every case, as it was then, the president's uh, choice. I think one of the few things that can be said pretty much as a fact about the Bay of Pigs is that although it might have failed, the invasion might have failed in any one of a number of ways. It did in fact fail because the battle was lost in the air. The most fragile commodity in the secret war is truth. This CIA transport is a relic of our Cuban crusade. Shot up while dropping supplies over Cuba, its American crew crash landed on this Guatemalan beach. At about that time, Washington was insisting that no Americans were involved. Another criticism is that we always seem to end up supporting right-wing dictatorships. Guatemala today, this is its military academy, has reverted to the jungle of a military dictatorship. The present regime was recognized by the United States less than a month after the overthrow of Edigaris Fuentes, who was the CIA's Guatemalan landlord. Don't we find ourselves supporting right-wing governments all around the world? I think it is a characteristic of much of the underdeveloped world that there is no responsible, competent center or even left of center. All too often, 
there, there is either an, an oligarchic regime, tribal in some areas, or more feudal, as in parts of Latin America and others, uh, and confronting it, an opposition that is hopelessly far to the left, explicitly communist allied. I take it that a part of our national political objective is to elicit, to bring into being, to encourage the creation in much of this part of the world of a responsible center, or even left of center. Well, and perhaps we're succeeding, uh, for instance, in, in some parts of, of, uh, of Latin America. But I think in this sense, viewed as a, a problem that confronts the nation, it has to be admitted that in many places we find ourselves supporting the right, uh, not because we're rightists, but because there literally is no other alternative to, to, to chaos uh, or, or, or to encouragement of those who have made themselves explicitly our enemy. There are people in Guatemala today who are explicitly our enemies, and this is their handiwork. This is what used to be the United States Aid Mission Garage in downtown Guatemala City. On New Year's Eve, it was invaded by communist terrorists. They destroyed 20 American automobiles and a traveling library donated by the citizens of Montgomery, Alabama. The same night, the guerrillas touched off an explosion at the American military mission and tried to set fire to an American refinery. Thus, Guatemalan politics continue following a melancholy routine. The pendulum is still swinging, and the new insurgents want it to swing away from our side. To them, the Alliance for Progress is a capitalist abstraction. Guatemala today is in a state of siege. Since February, all of its civil liberties have been suspended. Guatemala is subject to terrorism from serious insurgents. They have come close to killing Colonel Harold Hauser, chief of the American military mission, they have blown up a truck of soldiers on a downtown street. They have assassinated the chief of the secret police. They have held up the office of the United Fruit Company for an $18,000 haul. The CIA says Fidel Castro contributed 200,000 in 1963 alone. And it is estimated that the guerrillas now number 500, many in these hills. Their chief is a former Guatemalan army officer, one of the leaders of an unsuccessful revolt in 1960. Since then, Guatemala's police and army have been hunting him, but they can't catch him. NBC's Robert Rogers, not without difficulty, did. Rogers found him and interviewed him. His name is Marco Antonio Yansosa. Comandante Yansosa, why did you take to the mountains in 1960? Comandante Yansosa, ¿por qué se fue usted a las montañas después de 1960? Sí, al inicio de la lucha, se inició en en el 60, ¿no? Y uno de los motivos eh, que nos impulsaron a nosotros a irnos a las montañas a pelear. The eh, fighting began in 1960. La presencia de una base. Eh, One of the main reasons we went to the mountains to begin our struggle was the presence of the United States base at Elvetia, the Elvetia plantation, near Retauleo, to be more exact. Their American officers were training anti-Castro-Cuban mercenaries with the cooperation of the Iriguras Fuentes government. That is the one and only thing for which uh, we are grateful to the Central Intelligence Agency. If it were not for their interference in Guatemala at that time, well, we might not be fighting in the mountains today. They gave our movement its determination. Coming out, there have been constant rumors of, of uh, your people being trained in Cuba. This is not true. No. No. No, eh, por lo menos aquí en, en, en At least uh, for the present uh, here in Guatemala, there are no people who have been trading Cuba, uh, fighting with us, uh, maybe in some other countries, but here in Guatemala, no. Where did your, uh, the officers in your guerrilla movement become such expert jungle fighters? 
Bueno, el, el, el mejor entrenamiento es la lucha misma. Bueno, well, the best training is uh, combat itself. But we have some officers who were trained in the United States. Fort Benning. At Fort Benning. Y... The training they received there was uh, very good, bueno. excellent. Eh, con ese entrenamiento que recibieron... Without training and the support they received from the Guatemalan people, las guerrillas fueron soldados invencibles. They are invincible. How much military support uh, is the United States giving to the government here? Por lo menos les ha les ha equipado en estos últimos dos años alrededor de unos cuatro batallones. During the past two years, at least they have completely equipped four battalions, more than a regiment. Comandante, in the last two weeks, few weeks, your organization has burned the American aid garage here, tried to blow up the military mission, and tried to kill the chief of the American military mission here. El atentado contra el contra Colonel Hauser no es porque sea norteamericano gringo, pues. Colonel Hauser was attacked, not because he is an American, a gringo, but because he represents. He's a member of an army of the United States forces that are fighting in Vietnam. También el el coronel Hauser. Also, Colonel Hauser is one of the American officers advising the government forces, helping them repress the peasants in the areas where our guerrillas operate. Las guerrillas guatemaltecas. Ahora del del asunto del atentado contra contra la misión americana. Pues es la misma, tiene las más, fue por el mismo motivo, ¿no? As for the attack on the military mission, these Americans are instructing the government forces in how to fight our movement. De Guatemala, para combatirnos a nosotros. Entonces creemos también que es justo atacarlos a ellos, ¿no? No porque sean... I think it, it's, it's only right that we should attack them, not because they are Americans but because of what they are doing in our country. El atentado contra los vehículos y y el garage de la de la AVI también es por lo mismo. The attack on the aid vehicles and the garage was for the same reason. We oppose United States policy in Guatemala because it is an interventionist policy. The Americans come here and put presidents into office and remove them. Y ponen presidentes. Comandante, last week your your uh, men blew up an army truck right in the center of Guatemala City, and over the past months have assassinated a number of high government officials. Do you consider yourself a terrorist? Sí. Uh, habría que. Well, we have to study very carefully the word uh, terrorist. Terrorist, no? Eh, yo sé que a cualquiera le puede causar indignación. No sé que I know that uh, anyone can feel indignant when a truckload of soldiers is blown up in a city street. But you must consider the reason for our attack, the why. Tal vez hacía unos 20 días que una unidad a la que pertenecía. Maybe 20 days ago, the unit to which those soldiers belonged went into the mountains of Izabal. Y habían asesinado. They tortured and murdered the inhabitants. A la a la gente de a los habitantes de estas aldeas. 
Y habían violado también. They also raped a young girl before her whole family. La mamá y los hermanos y cuñados. Entonces, como represalia por esas atrocidades que están cometiendo en la montaña, fue que se hizo, se hizo ese. So we have to do something to destroy our truckload of soldiers or to execute an enemy does not give us a pleasure. But we must do these things. They serve a higher political purpose. What is wrong with U.S. policy uh, as far as uh, Commandant Jan Sosa is concerned? Why is he opposed to U.S. policy, the Alianza para el Progreso? Well, in cuanto a la Alianza para el Progreso, pues, eh, yo creo que si eh, fue inspirada con una buena intención. Well, I believe that the Alliance for Progress was inspired by the good intentions, but it is too late. In order to function at all, the Alliance needs certain basic preconditions. They have to present uh, tax reform, agrarian reform. But as soon as these reforms are attempted, the ruling classes, the oligarchy, the large landowners, and their allies, especially here in the case in Guatemala, they begin to maneuver against them. So they stop all progress. How then can we make progress peacefully? It's impossible. Can be done. Pacificamente no se puede. Poverty doesn't yield to, to short-term solutions. A political disorder doesn't yield to it. Situations like the one that did, in fact, historically obtain in Guatemala, where a small minority had seized the control of a weak government in a small, underdeveloped nation. Uh, situations of this kind really cannot be countered by any combination of actions that I can think of, at least in the short run, that, that can be subsumed under the heading of uh, working to remove the soil in which communism grows. There just do come moments, and unfortunately quite a lot of them in world affairs, where power has to be exerted. And uh, I have long felt that many of the criticisms of, that are leveled at this one agency of the government are in fact the criticisms of those who hate to admit to themselves or anyone else that power must sometimes be used. Uh, and as I implied a moment ago, uh, they choose to level their criticisms at one piece of the U.S. government in order to make these criticisms more acceptable. The activities of the CIA must be secret, but the debate about its role in our lives must be public. Here are the views of three men who know a lot about it. Well, in addition to the Department of State and the Department of Defense, why do we need a CIA? It's perfectly clear that most of our conflict with the USSR, and perhaps this is true or will be as true of, of China, is in the non-military dimension. We, we are rivals in ideas. We are rivals in economic activities. We are rivals in diplomacy. We are rivals in the exercise of the threat of the use of power. But we're also rivals in a whole variety of, of uh, activities that are not public, that are not open. They include espionage, they include subversion, which more precisely, I suppose, could be described as the effort to influence the course of events in, in other countries uh, covertly. If we're not prepared to meet all of these various challenges at their own level, I think the consequence is that we, we may gradually find ourselves forced to meet them at a level of escalation that we would not choose. 
Senator, now that we have apparently acquiesced in immoral acts on the part of the CIA, does this imperil our liberties or affect us in any constitutional way? Hard wouldn't go so far as to, as to say it constitutes at the present time a, a great threat to our liberties or to constitutional government. But I, I do think that uh, uh, it intrudes somewhat upon the traditional areas of, uh, and channels of representative government and of constitutional uh, government. As you know, you get charges and claims and counterclaims and countercharges that the CIA uh, makes its own policy. Uh, I think that perhaps in some cases it, it has, but whether it makes the policy and then brings it back and has it approved and then goes on to carry it out, I, I don't know. Uh, I know that criticism, uh, but I can assure you that as the machine works, uh, no important decisions are made on CIA evidence alone, as far as I know, not in any situation that I know. Certainly wasn't done in Cuba or in Guatemala or in these other cases. Uh, you have the charge that it has policies which are different from those which the State Department people in the same area may be trying to carry out. Some of the criticism of the CIA, some perhaps quite a part of its reputation uh, for being a law unto itself, comes from junior officials who, in all honesty, see it, learn of its activities after the fact, and have had no chance to participate in the decisions that prompted these actions to be taken. Well, Mr. Bissell, would these junior officials include ambassadors? I have known of cases. The ones, the only ones that I can remember are a good many years in the past when ambassadors have been kept in ignorance of activities of the CIA in the countries to which they were accredited, in every case, and without exception, with the express approval of the Secretary of State at the time. I don't think they give a full report uh, to any one of the committees uh, to, to which they do report. Uh, they report to armed services, uh, I understand, or to some people on the armed services, We've had some statements from those who are supposed to receive this testimony that they, they really don't know and don't want to know uh, what the uh, CIA is doing. I can assure you that the CIA, when I was there as director, and I'm quite sure it's the same with Mr. McCone, has given these committees full information about what it's doing, how it's spending its money, and how it operates. When I appeared before them again and again, I've been stopped by members of the Congress and say, we don't want to hear about that. We might talk in our sleep. Don't tell us this. As I say, I, I, I do feel that the, the fact that you, you have some kind of congressional supervision in addition to the executive supervision uh, would, would tend to keep a kind of uh, moral hold against just uh, what might become a kind of completely uh, uh, immoral or, or amoral operation. At the time of the uh, confirmation hearings on, on John McCone, uh, I raised the question as to what standards of, of judgment uh, the director of the CIA was prepared to apply to the activities of the CIA and of its agencies. And uh, I thought the response generally was not very satisfactory. It's a, a, a defense, as far as there was a defense, uh, was in the name that the CIA was primarily anti communist. Well, uh, this did not really get to the point which I was raising. I think even when you're dealing with communists, again, uh, we've traditionally held that no matter uh, who our enemy might be, uh, we, we still insist on the application of, of some measure of moral judgment or of moral standard. Those who believe that the U.S. government on occasion resorts to, to force when it shouldn't, uh, should in all fairness and justice D direct their views to the question of national policy uh, and not hide behind the criticism uh, that whereas the president and cabinet generally are enlightened people, uh, there is uh, uh, an evil and ill-controlled agency which imports this sinister element into, into U.S. policy. As citizens of the United States in the second half of this century, we are learning to live with some uncomfortable realities. 
We live in a sort of ethical coexistence with our nuclear warheads and missiles because we acknowledge the inevitability of their possession. Given the state of the world and our position in it, it was inevitable that we acquire these awful weapons. What all of us may not realize, however, is that we have created another weapon system of secret and subversive action. This, too, given the state of the world, may have been inevitable. We have created elaborate safeguards against the misuse of the warheads, but the warheads are in reserve. The CIA is not. It is on active duty in a constant, secret, dirty war. Safeguards in this area are less effective. The problem we have is how to reconcile the necessity of the CIA with its secret offenses against our public morality. It's getting more and more difficult to be an American these days, and there doesn't seem to be much that we can do about it. Thank you. And good night.